Hey there, Earthlets. I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my House of Love. And welcome to the second chapter in the saga of the Men in Black. Now when we last left off, Agent K had let himself be neuralized, erasing hundreds of memories and several years of old cases. But that's the thing about old cases. Sometimes they end up being not entirely closed. Released in 2002, Men in Black 2 is, as the name suggests, the sequel to the popular classic loosely based on the Lowell Cunningham penned comic. The secret to stopping a dangerous alien criminal lies in the brain of an ex-MIB agent, and only Agent J can solve this mystery and save the Earth. Sadly, this movie is not as well received as its predecessor, and only carries a 39% rating at Rotten Tomatoes. But is this movie really so terrible? Well, let's find out as we dive into the second of this series, Men in Black 2. It's five years later, and Jay's latest partner isn't working out. Now, after Elle returned to her pre-MIB life, as I detailed at the end of the last episode, Jay has had many partners none of whom have managed to meet his exacting standards. Case in point, T, a former marine who was far too gung-ho about the sensitive job of immigrant wrangling. But the rules dictate that each agent must have a partner. I'll be his partner. And it's here that we meet Laura. She's a witness to a crime, which ties into an unauthorised landing which ties into the memories of former Agent K. Jay goes to fetch Kevin Brown, but K's denuralization is interrupted. You see, Sir Lena, the Kylothian Queen, is in town, and she's looking for... Well, that'd be telling, if we hadn't already seen the prologue. But we'll get to that. Which brings us once again to the door of Jack Jeebs whose homemade denuralizer is a little ramshackle and requires a mental reboot, but it's still good. Jeebs' neuralizer wasn't running on the latest version of the software, all of which leads to another House of Love top tip. Update early and often. You may lose some features in the process, but you'll always have a more robust software product. And the plot finally gets underway, as our reunited heroes head to the pizza joint where Laura worked. And where Kay left a clue. Which leads to a video store. Where we rediscover the whole story. Okay, so I've been dancing around this a little, but... The whole story is actually explained in the prologue. In short, two alien races, the Zarthans and the Kylothians, were at war. The Zarthans wanted to put a powerful weapon on Earth, the Light of Zartha. Earth, being neutral, refused, and shot the light back into space on a rocket. Serlina followed, vowing to possess the light and destroy the Zarthans. But what the prologue doesn't tell us, and what Serlina never knew, was that the light was actually a person, the daughter of the Princess Lorana, and Kay himself. The boys along with some extra muscle, tool up to storm MIB HQ, which actually works. So why are they storming MIB HQ? Well, Selina disabled most of the MIB staff and caused a complete Code 101 lockdown, which is a total atmospheric seal. But they still have to get the light of Zartha off Earth which they manage with barely a second to spare. So there isn't really much of a denouement to this movie. Just some bit about the Statue of Liberty being a massive neuralizer, And that MIB HQ backs out in a massive airport locker. Which then backs out into a massive airport type space. And if I have downplayed the villain rather a lot, 
It's because there isn't much to see of her. After about her introduction and that. Anyway, that was Men in Black 2. But I think that the critics might have been right on this one. I don't think that I could put this one into my house of love. This isn't MIB 1 all over again. And even if it was, it'd still have the flaws of that movie, being that Originitis loomed large over the first movie. And once again, Smith and Jones make a pair, grumpy and streetwise, old and busted and new hotness. An original odd couple ere there were. Boosted by Tim Blaney's Frank the Romulian Pug, and a smattering of smaller roles, including Patrick Warburton as ex-Marine T, and Riptorn's Commander Z. The performances are standout, and occasionally oversharing. <laughs> and what we see of the villains, Lara Flynn Boyle's Serlina, and Johnny Knoxville's Shrad and Charlie, they are rather standard in the despairing villainess and her incompetent foil, but they are heavily underused. The main flaw of the movie though is in its flow. It spends far too much time setting up the recovery and demuralization of Kay, and far too little time on the main threat to Earth of a plant-based warmonger who seeks to destroy an entire race for a reason that's never explained. And sure, it's funny enough, and the Michael Jackson cameo, being that the man himself would have had to be in on the joke for them not to use a sound alike and look alike, is inspired. But this movie is 77 minutes before credits and 84 in total, and it's 40 odd minutes before the plot even kicks in. So yes, it's a little rushed. But there's still plenty to like about this movie. The returning Tony Shalhoub as Jack Jeebs, now replete with afro and beard, and teeth turned all the way up to 11, remains a joy. And there are plenty of visual gags, and the effects of the Rick Baker studio are still as glorious as ever. But the attempts at pathos, and the non-romance between Smith and Rosario Dawson, fall flat quite quickly. No, Men in Black 2 isn't Men in Black 1 again. But for all its faults, out of the hundreds of memories a man in black would want to neuralise himself of, this movie is definitely not one of them. So thanks for watching. If you liked this video, join me next week for the third in the trilogy. In the meantime, why not consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell? Or if you want to be extraterrestrially awesome, check out my crowdfunding links in the description below. But for now, this is Agent FM wishing you Splundig ver folks.